cool. So, um, whilst everyone catches up and we'll let them in, a um, bit of news about AAT. Uh, was anyone thinking of sitting their advanced bookkeeping exam at home, being one of the exams that is going to be available remotely in August? Because if you were, um, AAT have announced that unlike if you go and sit your exam in centre, you will not get your results straight away. There is a up to two week wait to get your results if you sit your exam at home. Cool. Um, also, whilst I've got you and wait for people to come in, has anyone got the exam booked as yet? Absolutely. No, no. Um, actually, it's been quite interesting, actually. Uh, I've had a lot of students book a lot of exams and. Um, doesn't seem to be any sort of issues. Uh, people have just booked lots of exams. It's like the good old days where students have booked an exam and we write in a diary that they've got it booked just so we can chase them up, say good luck and whatnot. It's, 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 we've not had the issues of people not being able to book the exam due to capacity that we thought. Um, quite interesting, actually. Now, you might have seen the day banded around that they can't schedule exams till the 22nd. The 22nd of June is when they physically can go on the AT so, um, software and say this person here is sitting this exam then. Um, but um, they can't, what they're doing at the moment is putting you in the diary, uh, which isn't a problem. But um, but yeah, quite interesting. So if you've got a book. Cool. So um, this evening we are going to look at task one of the AT sample assessment. The reason being it's the first one that you will do. Um, it should be one you get good marks on, and it is one that students typically do well on. So if you do this first, get some marks on the board, you feel a lot more confident as when you come to tasks three and four, which you really want students to struggle with. Um, and also, it was the first one I did, lots of people missed it, and if I'm being honest, I forgot to record it. So if you're doing this one again, uh, it will complete the set. Um, all the recordings are now on our YouTube channel, um, so I will prompt everyone to say it is out and here's the link um, tomorrow, it's not going to be tonight. Um, but you can all see the, all the other ones there, so all the decision control, advanced synoptic, they're going up there, advanced synoptic proven really, really popular. Uh, Rebecca is doing that, getting grave reviews. Um, really good. Um, also a bit of a shameless plug, um, don't forget we've got our 25% off online, online live, whole level, bookkeeping and single units. And as of, it was, well, it was yesterday, but I wasn't here yesterday, we have launched our new, exciting, amazing mock product. Uh, so you can see the link here. And for just £15 per unit, £15, that's all it is, uh, you will get a um, video, uh, video, video debrief of a different mock. You will get two marked mocks online which take into account your own figures uh just like the at exam very very clever which all come with detailed um explanations and workings if you get a question wrong you can know why it's got wrong uh you also see which you, your scores on each task unlike the at mocks and you get uh explanations of the at sample assessment 50 pound per unit cannot go wrong anyway conscious of time let's move on uh, Ah, Sarah, uh, good question. Now, if you are an online or an online live student, do not buy our mock products. Uh, you have those mocks already. Um, so, however, if you, um, I'll come to that. However, if you are not a first intuition student or you are a self-study student, these are mocks that you haven't seen. And Sarah, unlike people like those people who I will not mention that you have mentioned in the chat. Uh, we explain every single question. So if you get a question wrong, uh, instead of uh, just saying £1,200 like Osborne do, um, you, you can actually see where that figures come from. Many, many years ago, I used to work elsewhere. We used to use Osborne books. And I remember one question, it was a accruals and prepayments question. Um, you had a, it was a really weird one because you had like an opening accrual but closing prepayment, which is not normally what you get in practice. Um, and that is quite tricky. And you get to the back, it just said, £1,200 
three times a week, I would explain how £1,200 is calculated. Not the best use of my time, to be honest. So if you write the explanation and put it in the book, that frees you to spend time where you do add value as a tutor, which is ethics and marking written questions and things like that. No, definitely not. I would never, A, because that would be illegal, and B, I wouldn't lower myself. I would, if I write a question, I'd do it right, and I'd give proper explanations, and then I'd have to explain it myself. Did you answer that? No, even if it was legal, I wouldn't make someone else's work because I wouldn't bother. I'd do it once, and I'd do it right. The job's worth doing. Anyway, speaking of doing a job, let's move on to, um, to this. So this is task one. It is a fixed asset register. It is something that you will have to do in your exam. This is how it will be in the exam. They do not vary the question style very much. It will be laid out like this pretty much. Um, and it is something that you will do in practice. So, um, so I've actually got one here. Uh, this is taken from, this is actually the AAT's accounts. Um, don't know if you can see that or not. So what happens is you will um, see the AAT's accounts. I presume you can read it, uh, fair enough, uh, mainly. Um, so here you can see you've got intangible assets, tangible assets, and it just says 536 thousand pounds worth of tangible assets what is that so that's in the account and then you go to the notes of the account you can see here how it's made up so you've got the cost and then you've got the depreciation and then you've got the net book value which down here you can see the 536 thousand pounds now the working papers behind that will be a fixed asset register and one of the jobs i used to do when i was an auditor was make sure that things that were on the fixed asset register actually existed so I would go with a fixed asset register, which had many, many items on. And obviously, I'm not going to check every one because I've got all day. And I would choose items at random. So the client didn't know which ones they were going to choose. And I'd say, I would like to see that piece of machinery, please. Um, true fact, actually, I am actually a qualified farmer. I've got a degree in farming, honest to God. And um, so anyway, didn't work out. Anyway, did AT, went to do my chart exams. And when I did my chart exams, because you have to work at a firm of, Chartered accountants, I I got the job of doing all the agricultural audits because the person before me had not no idea. So he went, I want to go and see that tractor. They could have showed him a shovel and he would have no idea. Um, so at least I knew that when I say I want to see the combine harvester, it's actually a combine harvester. Um, so this is getting level four auditing stuff, but you would go with a fixed asset register and say, I want to see that item. And you make sure that the assets that the company says they have, that they have on there, actually do exist because if not it could be a lie true story there was a um second-hand car dealer who he would uh, when it comes to his audit he would put his staffs or people who worked for him their own cars on the fixed asset register and get them to drive into work that day and say i own that car and made the balance sheet look really good um and then you do other tests and actually make sure that they have log books and stuff like that anyway i digress um in the AT exam, you won't be doing any checking like this. Um, you will just assume everything in there is legitimate. And all you're doing is filling in um, the blanks. So um, you will have to calculate depreciation. Um, in this revision session, I will be assuming you have at least opened a advanced bookkeeping textbook. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how to calculate depreciation. Oh, I'm not gonna tell you what depreciation is uh, the revision session. Um, if you gave tuition sessions away for free, I won't have a job. I like my job. So this is it. We'll start with Mach 1 because that's in the sense of place to start. Um, it's all about non-current assets, um, which it will be. It is a 21 mark task, I think. Um, but you should be spending, yeah, it is 21. It says up there. But you should be spending 25 minutes on this task. You get 1.2 minutes per mark. Um, it's a 100 mark exam. So you could leave it blank, but that means that you need to have to get everything else pretty much perfect, which with task three and four is unlikely. So um, you, you can't, there's only five tasks in advanced bookkeeping. So um, you can't really have a dodgy question. So you need to be able to do it. So we've got some information. Um, we're working on account records for business. Doesn't really matter what it's called, if being honest. And we have been told we may ignore that for this task. That's good. Um, because it's very, very important in these types of questions 
you know if the business is VAT registered or not. Um, the reason being, obviously, if a company is VAT registered, the cost to the business is the net figure. If you are not VAT registered, such as likes of me and probably you, when you buy something, the true cost to you is the gross figure because you can't get the VAT back. Really, really important. If you start putting gross figures in for a business that is VAT registered, you'll fail the question. Perhaps not the exam, but you will fail the question. The own figure rule does apply. And conversely, if the company isn't VAT registered, the gross figures should go in the successive register. Anyway, we, we are ignoring VAT for this task. Now, you don't need to know this, but um, the, the questions are all brought down from a bank and they're standardized to the same level of difficulty. So if you can ignore VAT, it makes it a little bit easier. Then the alarm bells just start ringing saying, well, if I don't have to do that, it's made it easier. What are they doing later on to make it more difficult? And we'll see. Um, so the following is an extract from a purchase invoice received. So you can see we bought some things and you don't need to know how an electric combi steam oven works. Um, but you, you need to know what you're going to capitalize and what you are not. That's one of the key things in this question is what are you going to capitalize? So things to bring it into um, use. So like if, if you have to pay this amount before you can use it, um, you will capitalize it. If you don't have to pay it, you won't capitalize it. So for example, uh, delivery, you, you've got to, if you can't, if you can't use it, if you don't get it delivered. If you physically not allowed to use it until it's been tested, You've got to put, you've capitalized the testing figure. Um, if it's training, um, you don't actually have to train your staff. They could use it, might not be able to do it very well. Uh, and then con um, things like service contracts, they're not capitalized there. There'll be a prepayment, that's task three, and that's spread out over the cost of the service contract uh, and consumables, which we'll see in, in the next question, really. So what we've got, we've got some, a combi steam oven, of a, of a display, a floor stand, um, which are for the combi steam oven, and then we've got an electric portable pasta boiler. Now the acquisition has made been made under a lease agreement. Uh, not a major thing, but it is something that we will need to deal with at some point. The reason being, um, when you do the accounts, you do normally show some assets which are owned, and you show the assets which are leased, because the assets that are leased, you from a legal point of view, you do not technically own until you pay that last uh, lease payment. And so they could technically take those assets off you. So you do disclose them separately, but you don't need to know that. Uh, that's good to hear. Fran, £15, uh, you know, is a good investment. And Fran speaks from experience, uses our material. Um, like I said, everything, even if you buy our self-study material, which is there, £35 per unit plus postage. Every single question is explained with detailed feedback and narrative. Can't go wrong. Um, move on. The following information makes the sale of some computer equipment no longer used by the business. It was sold for £180. And really, really important, it tells us the date of sale. And we've also got the um, date of purchase for this new piece of machinery. So we've got some extra information here. So this company has a policy of capitalizing expenditure over 500 pounds. Really, really important is that uh, if, if it's, and to be honest, that's quite typical. So the reason being, if you bought a kettle for 15 pound, um, I wouldn't pay 15 quid for a kettle myself, but if you did, you wouldn't capitalize it because say you did, I don't know, 25% reducing balance, what 25% of 15 quid, like £3.50. So you, you calculate it's going to lose £3.50 this year, and then it would lose £2.75 or something next year. And the, the amount of difference it makes, the overall picture of the account, is neither here nor there. And you're wasting a lot of the time paying the account to do it. So you just don't bother because it just doesn't make any difference. So we would have a real world housing practice. We wouldn't capitalise anything under £250. It just depends on the business. Um, yeah, basically, it might be an asset. It might be something that, you know, you would um, think is going to be worth something in 12 months time, because typically that's the definition of an asset. Uh, it's still worth something this time next year. Um, but you just won't bother because no one cares. Now, you have to be quite careful in practice because an extreme example is someone buys a brick for 
two pounds. Then buy another brick. Then buy another brick. And you just write it off. You write it off. And eventually, you've actually used those bricks to build a building. Um, so, we've got, you know, if, if things sort of do lump together, which we'll see here, uh, you might capitalize things under 250 pounds. But normally, if it's a standalone thing like, like a 50 quid printer or something, you just put it to office expenses. Life's too short. Um, I say it doesn't make a big difference. Um, it, and then obviously the size of the company. I mean, some companies deal with a big piece of machinery, turn over 70 million quid. Their figure might be, you know, four or five grand. Um, you never know. It's just because it's not going to make that much difference to the overall picture. And like I say, life's too short. Whereas a smaller company might, like you bring it down here, bring it down to 500 pounds. Um, next, we've got computer equipment depreciated 20% diminishing balance basis. Now, this is one of the things that came in for AK 2016. The AVVK examiner just, uh, he, he liked to have a um, thesaurus and he just used loads of different terminology uh, when everyone else would use reducing balance. Um, but it means the same thing. So just be wary of that. So you've got straight line basis on cost uh, over 10 years, um, you know, that sort of thing. That all means the same thing, which is straight line basis. And assuming no residual value for that computer equipment. Remember, 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 residual balance, uh, residual value, we only take that into account for straight line. We don't do it for reducing balance because it's just an incredibly complicated um, calculation. Don't worry about that. They will try and catch you out. Ignore residual value if it's straight, if it's reducing balance because it's only for straight line. Now, this is where the, the, the making this question tricky. Normally, the default position is, unless you're told otherwise, assume this, a full year's worth of depreciation in the year of acquisition, none in the year of disposal. So that's normally what we do in practice, because, you know, it doesn't make that much difference if they buy it quite late in the first year, so they get a full year's worth of depreciation and they sell it quite late, so they don't get any depreciation, even though it's there for most of the year. It balances out with different assets, and like I say, life's too short. Whereas, um, if they're being picky, perhaps they're doing management accounts. Here, we are calculating depreciation on an annual basis, but it's charged in equal installments for each month the asset is owned. So we will, if it's, if it's owned for six months a year, we will charge six months worth of depreciation in the year of disposal, um, not just give it zero. This is the tricky bit. Now, most importantly, it's a 31st of March 2007 year end. Any question, ABBK, get that um, year end clear in your head. If you don't, fail a question. Simple as that. Um, so we, we need to record the following acquisitions, um, transactions, any acquisitions, disposals, and depreciations. You will have to do that in every question. Straight as simple as that. Um, also, answers to two decimal places and give it in days, months and years in that format. These questions are marked by a computer and if you do not give your answer in the correct format, they will mark it as wrong even if your figures are correct. So, let's start looking at um, filling in the fixed asset register because that's what we're here to do. Uh, Get a pen, I'll get rid of my highlighter. So, the first, you may as well start at the top because you've got to do it all. Kitchen equipment. So, kitchen equipment, um, the only thing we've been told there is this invoice here. Um, this disposal relates to a computer, so that goes under computer equipment, obviously. Um, now, the key thing is what are we going to capitalize? So the combi steam oven is clearly over 500 pounds. Remember, that's the figure that makes the difference, uh, 500 pounds. So we're going to capitalize that. The color touch display, it is for this asset. And it's over 500 pounds, we're going, to, we're going to capitalize that. Now the floor stand is actually an integral part of this. So you can see it's, it's for the combi steam oven. So even though it's not 500 pounds, we are going to capitalize that. So effectively, it is one part, it, yeah, the one asset split into three different bits and they all get stuck together. And when you dispose of it, you wouldn't dispose of the oven display, but think I'll, I'll keep that stand because it's really useful for the next time I buy a combi steam 31 oven. 
um, it, you just dispose, so it would all become one and it would dispose of as one um, and it would become one sort of cost center if you were doing that. It is one thing, it's just added to it. Whereas the electric portable pasta boiler, um, it's 245 pound, it, it's a standalone item, um, it's under 500 pounds, we're not gonna bother, it's life too short. So the amount that we're going to capitalize would be uh, 5565 plus 999 plus 224 gives us uh, 6,788. So we've got to get filling all our boxes here. So what we got? It was bought on the 1st of April, X6, and C, not C, C, S, O, 31. And you would normally, you wouldn't just put steam oven in your fixed asset register. The reason being, you might have more than one steam oven. You need to be able to identify it. So you'd need to go, I want to choose to look at this steam oven and then go, it's that one there. And like typically with like vehicles, I used to do an audit for a big glass company. I had loads of different vans and they all had private number plates and each one in the fixed asset register was um, had its number plate in there. So you can see when that vehicle disposed of, you can identify which one it is and the net value of that one rather than just saying van because it's all really good, but you keep this asset for four or five years, then you don't like it. I can't remember. And you have to go digging up the things. So you want to be quite specific in your uh, description of what it is, you know, serial number, like it says here. So first April 2006, I can't remember what we came up with. Uh, it was 6,788. So that would go in the cost, 6,788. Now, Luckily, it was bought on the first day of the financial year, so we're going to give it a full year's worth of depreciation. Um, what was the depreciation thing? So kitchen equipment is depreciated at 20% diminishing balance basis. So we get that, times it by 0.2, gives us 1,000, make sure I'm putting it in the right column, yeah, 1,350. Fifty-seven pounds and sixty pence. So that means the net book value is going to be six seven eight eight minus one three five seven point six gives us five thousand four hundred and thirty pounds and forty pence. Obviously, you type it in and you'd be able to fit it in. And for top marks, you want to put that it's on lease because. That asset, theoretically, if you don't keep up the payments, can be taken off us. Uh, so moving on, we've got computer equipment. So we've got a restaurant point of sale ta tablet bundle. Who says AAT is not with the times? So here, well, computer equipment is on straight line basis, assuming no residual value. Now this is a bit of a giveaway because they've given you the previous netbook value, and they're giving you this year's netbook value. Um, it's not been disposed of this year, so it's going to get a full year's worth of depreciation. So it's going to be the same as last year. Um, you could work it out, you could be bothered, um, but that's what it is. Um, it's over four years, so it's just the 1,380 divided by four, which is 345 pounds. That's what it is. That's been a giveaway. Talk on. Now, this is the bit that is the testing one. So it's the desktop machine DT3, this one here. It was sold for 180 pounds. So um, the first thing we do is, is get some easy marks. Proceeds, 180 pound, and uh, disposal date was, when was it first? My question for you all, how many months did we own it in this year? A year. Start of the year would be 1st of April 2006, and we sold it on the 31st of December 2006. Cool, yeah. You've got to be really, really careful in AAT, because, especially with accruals and prepayments, personal tax, financial statements, make sure the number of months. And you look like a bit of a pillock in the exam, counting on your fingers. I have always counted on my fingers. Whenever you do, like, accruals and prepayments, or you do... Um, personal private residence or um, accrual repayments in financial statements. You, AAT assumes you can count to 12. 
and it's very, very easy to get it wrong. So you might put the 1st of April to the 31st of December, that is nine months. That's right, you're all right with those who wrote, wrote nine. Now, if it was bought, purchased on the 30th of April to the 31st of December, that is eight months. So the 1st of April to the 31st is nine, 30th of April is only eight. Be very, very careful about that. I, 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 even when I write PPR questions now, especially a PPR, I count my fingers, you don't want to be throwing away easy marks. Now, the depreciation for a year, so it's four year straight line, so it's 579.84. I mean, it will be the previous years, but let's just do it. 144.96 is a full year's worth of depreciation, but we're only going to charge nine twelfths of that. So divide by 12 times nine gives us 108. 72 and then we've got carrying them out never have ever put anything in there i get that all the time i don't you don't own the asset you can't have anything in there because what you really want is add up your carrying amount figure here that'll be total and that should marry up to your account you can't have something in there if you don't own it because that's, that's cheating and that's your fixed asset register that's the main thing what do you ever think to that Uh, depreciation for DDS4. Where is DDS4? Yes, spotted up at the top. Um, basically, yeah, don't miss it out because you're throwing away marks. But that would be, you can see, that's on reducing balance. So we're going to base that on the net book value of 1276.8, and we are on, is it 20% or 25? 20% diminishing balance, which is the same as reduced balance, so it's 0 0.2, so we're going to base it on 0.2% of this figure. It's not on cost like the computer equipment was. So that would be 255.36, which means for that, minus 1, 2, 7, 6. Did I, did I use 1275 or 1276? 1, 1276.8 times 0.2. Now I was right, uh, 255.36. Minus the 1276.80. Oh, you're all there before me. 102.144. Yeah, don't just rush ahead, bowing through all these types of something like that. Uh, it's very easily done. And you were smart. Cool. That's not too bad. Like I say, this is one of the tasks that um, students typically do well on. Uh, and if I'm being honest, if you're struggling with fixed asset registers, you shouldn't be seeing this exam because it's only a bit more difficult. I promise you that. So <clears throat> it's important, and then you've got a few multiple choice questions. Never ever ever leave this blank. There is no negative marking. If you leave it blank, you'll definitely get it wrong. Obviously, ideally, you would know the answer. Um, if you don't in the exam, remember you're there for one thing alone on exam day, pass the exam, nothing else. If you get um, you know, the, your ability to do with the job between if you get 69% and guess one mark and get the 70, or you get 70 because you know it's neither way there, just pass your exam, never leave them blank. Um, so we go with, so I will ask you A, B, and C. Why is it important to get prior authority for capital expenditure? Yeah, um, materiality is important, but it's got nothing to do with capital expenditure. When you buy something, um, you're either going to capitalise it or you're not. Either way, it's going to cost money. So, um, you know, you need to get, um, you know, you need to get authority to buy it. It doesn't matter whether you capitalise it or not. So that's not really relevant. Um, comply with financial points. That is just completely irrelevant. Um, you should be doing that anyway, whether you buy anything or not. Um, and likewise, the last one is this one here because the business should benefit you shouldn't buy things willy-nilly that you do not need whether you're going to capitalize it or not it should benefit in business and would you ask the bank manager or would you not um to give you authority to spend some money no um the bank manager might stop you from buying something uh, if you need to borrow some money but you wouldn't go and ask them um you're not beholden to the bank manager mostly so that's not too bad. Uh, let's have a look at MOP2, which is a little bit 
different. Uh, we've got something else going on, so we haven't got any messing around with depreciation, but we have got some other messing around. Uh, part X. Part X is typically things students don't like, and Part X uh, could come up in this task as it does here. It could also come up in task two with disposal. Um, it's the sort of thing which might come up, it might not come up, it shouldn't be the sort of thing that you're hoping it doesn't, uh, because if it does, you're in trouble, world of trouble, because it makes such a big difference. So, <coughs> I mean, as Sarah says, really, really important, um, his company is registered, what am I doing there? Wrong one. Um, is registered for VAT. So that's really, really important. So, you all know this, we won't be capitalising the gross figures, we will be capitalising the net. So, let's run through this invoice, let's decide what we're going to capitalise or not. So, we bought a screen printer. Uh, first thing to do is, they've got a policy of advertising of £750. So, the screen printer is clearly over £750. It's going to capitalise. So, the next bit is a floor stand. Um, that is clearly part of this SP4200, probably won't fit anything else, it is an integral part of that, so we are going to capitalise that. Whereas the screen printing mesh at 100 metres per roll, now you don't have to be an expert on a screen printer and printing and whatnot to probably think that's not part of that and you are going to use that in printing down the line. So you, that will eventually go into your cost of sales. So we're not going to capitalise that. And then obviously we're not going to capitalise that uh, because the business is in fact registered. So moving on to make it slightly more interesting is the following information relates to the re machine replace. So printer that was sold was PM101 because we need to be able to write that one out of our fixed asset register, uh, date of sale, and then the part X value. Now, just like when we buy something, we're only going to use the net figure. When we sell it, the amount of money you get to keep, although they might sell you whatever £1,750 plus VAT is, so they might give you that amount of cash, you don't keep it. The VAT you hold and then you'll give to HMRC. It's not your money. So the amount of money you will actually get, and that this is the figure we'll use for the profit loss on disposal, is £1,750, because that's all you're going to get. So, let's start plugging some figures in here. So we know it's £750, we've already identified what we're going to capitalise or not. Plant and machinery depreciated over eight years, straight line basis, assuming no residual value, that's fairly decent. Motor vehicles depreciate 25%, on a diminishing balance, balance basis or reducing balance. 25% is typically what we would use for motor vehicles. The, the, you don't need to know this, but the reason being is machinery generally falls in value as you use it, and you'll probably use it as much as in year two as you will in year one, um, and so it, it falls over a you know, straight line. Whereas cars, you get a brand new car, as soon as you drive it off the uh, forecourt, which you can do now, um, it falls loads in value. Whereas a car that's seven years old, it's not going to fall in value that much to uh, as much as even as a percentage as when it's eight years old. So we use 25% typically for cars. Um, but you, you, there isn't like a set policy for how much you depreciate assets. You can choose. Um, you just got to be consistent um, because this is getting to level four tax, but you might find it interesting. You might not. Um, depreciation is not allowable tax. So you can choose any depreciation rate because HMRC will go, oh, that's, that's really great. Um, you're not having that as an expense, you will use our rules, which is capital allowances, um, but don't worry about them, they come at level four. So you've just got to choose something that is sensible and consistent. You cannot go changing it from one percentage one year to another percentage one uh, another year, and everything within the same class, so all cars have to be depreciated at 25%. You can't have like a Merc at 30% and a Polo at 20%. It's got to be the same class. But don't worry about that. You will be told in the exam what depreciation rate to you, so don't worry about that. And because you're just messing around with the part X, to make it a little bit fairer, we're going with a full year's depreciation in the year of acquisition and none in the year of disposal. To make it well straightforward. 
uh, and then it tells us what to do, which is the same in any question. So the first thing we're going to look at is this start from the top PM 101. So we've disposed of it. Uh, we got £1,750 for it, and we've been told there's no depreciation in the year of disposal. So there'll be no depreciation charges. Now, you just wouldn't touch this, but I'm putting zeros in for consistency. There'll be no carrying them out. And then we will get rid of it. So there's no funding method. We've got this up here. But there is disposal proceeds. And that will go of £1,750 and disposal date, um, which was the 31st of the 7th X6 for consistency. Um, so we get marked right. So that is that. However, we have now got to uh, purchase our new asset, which is the SP420. In the exam, you get drop down boxes and you just choose the right one. You don't have to decide what you're going to call it, but um, I haven't got drop down boxes. So SP420. So we've decided what we're going to capitalize. We're going to capitalize the original purchase, which is 4950. <coughs> then we're going to capitalize the floor stand. It's £596, and we're not going to capitalise the screen mesh, are we? Um, so we're going to capitalise the figure of £5,546. Is everyone clear where that one's come from and why it's that figure? Why are we ignoring the screen print and why are we ignoring the VAT? Cool. So, so make sure we fill in all the boxes, we don't want to miss any. Um, so we bought it on the 31st of July. And it cost five five four six. Then we're going to depreciate it now. So this is plant and machinery. Plant and machinery. Um, the reason being, Sandra, is the screen printer is obviously over the seven hundred fifty pound. It's going to be depreciated. The floor stand is an integral part of that asset. You wouldn't once you bought the stand for it, you stick it on it. It's no good for anything else. It, it, you know, so it is quite effectively, it's going to be one asset together. So if when you dispose of it, it'll be sold together. You won't think, I'll keep that floor that stand that's specific for an FP4200. Um, so they, they'll be one of the same. It's not something that you could use the floor stand on its own. So we were going to capitalize that. Whereas the screen printing mesh is, is not something that's bringing the asset into use. Um, it, you don't have to buy it on this invoice. You could buy it later, and obviously it's then under the seven hundred and fifty pounds. It is something you're going to use to make your cost of sales. And then, because the business is fat registered, we just ignore VAT. So the true cost to the business is what it paid. Uh, it was is the net. We say it's going to, although it pays the VAT out, it gets it back. So at the end of the day, down the line, anyway, uh, the true cost uh, to the business is the net figure. So the 5,546 is going to depreciate it over eight years on a straight line basis, which is relatively good. So that's 5546 divided by eight is 69325. So six, now remember we're working to two decimal places, 69325. So the carrying amount or net book value is 69325 minus 5546 should be Four thousand eight hundred fifty-two pound seventy-five pence. Now the funding method is also got to go here, and it was paid for by higher purchase. Quite wise, come up with hand. I don't know. There we are. Um, so it's so that's going to be paid for by HP, isn't it? And higher purchase, you don't technically own it until um, you pay that final po um, payment at the end. No, the depreciation here, if I find it, I'm, I'm sure I'm right. Yeah, so we, it doesn't matter when we bought the asset. So we are a March year end and we bought it on the 31st of July 2006, which will be April, May, June. Uh, so nine months in. So we've got nine years worth. We own it for nine months of the um, financial year. However, yeah, 
full use depreciation in the year of acquisition and none in the year of disposal. And I'm assuming, Sarah, you are saying read the full question and nothing else. We'll go with read the full question. <laughs> cool. So it's brought on HP. Um, <laughs> yeah. Motor vehicles, where are we at? So we've got some motor vehicles. Um, these are on reducing balance, 25% as you are. And so we've just got to calculate a full years of depreciation on these because they've not been sold, no purchase. Um, so remember, it's 25% based on the previous year's net book value. So it's going to be 5310.36 times 0.25 gives us 1327.59, which taken off the previous year's carrying amount gives us, I should really run a bit more, 3982.77. Uh, we'll do the next one a bit better. So again, the next one is 25% of the previous year's net book value. So 6540 times 0.25 gives us 1,635. You see, with reducing balance uh, depreciation, how each year the depreciation is going down in value. Uh, the depreciation amount is going down in value because the asset isn't falling as much because typically what cars do. So 6540 uh, less than 163. One, Six three five gives us four thousand nine hundred and five pounds. So that's our ETB, uh, not ETB, fixed asset register. ETB classified. Is that fairly straightforward? Before we move on to uh, anything else, see that AT water bottle got that last year's AT two conference. This year got nothing because it was virtual. Absolutely got it. Anyway, uh, moving on. Did get shortlisted for Institute of the Year, though. Just saying. And online college of the year, but that's not as important as Institute of the Year. Um, so, last one. A very good question, Alison. Um, when it comes to straight line depreciation, we can take into account residual value because it's relatively straightforward. What we do is just take off the residual value from the cost and then divide. The difference, because that's the amount that's going to fall over X amount of years, and that'll be the charge per year. Where it, whereas the, um, it is incredibly dif difficult to calculate a percentage which is going to leave you with a set amount of um, um, at the end of the of a set period. So, um, if you wanted to say an asset that was worth a thousand pounds at the end of after four years and it was worth five thousand pounds there's an incredibly complicated calculation and the easy the, the other way to do it is doing by sort of trial and error and trying to calculate a percentage that it will leave you that but then the problem with that is that um depreciation rate is specific for that asset whereas um if you use a straight line basis, you're using the same number of, uh, so that you depreciate it over the same amount of period time, but you just take into account. So every asset could be depreciated over eight years, but one of them um, has, you know, you just take into account the residual value. It's just incredibly complicated to get a percentage that will leave you with a set amount after uh, a certain number of years. Um, Cheryl, the part X. Part X is split over here. So you've got the asset that's disposed of, which went for £750, which is this one here. And then you've got the asset that was purchased, which is this one here. Um, in reality, we then go on and in the Part X calculation, calculate the, the profit and loss on disposal, which in this case would be a loss because um, it had a net value of £2,100. And we had a proceeds of £1,750, but that is task two, not task one. We don't care about all we do with the part X is um, calculating the proceeds. We wouldn't we're overly worry about part X. Yeah. Um, Sarah, now that is actually quite a good question about whether you capitalise your own labour or not. The answer is no, you don't capitalize your own labor. Uh, if you buy in labor, you do. Um, 
looking at capitalized uh, year and labor. Yeah, probably a little bit beyond AAT, to be honest. Um, yeah, if there's a new service launch or anything like that, the question is, do you need to pay that? Uh, that's a part X is sorry, part exchange. So when you sell an asset, you get instead of getting money for it, you get a bit knocked off a new asset that you're buying. No, but um, but yeah, going back to um, Sarah's question, um, if there's a new like service launch, if you have like a opening ceremony or something, you don't need to do that. You wouldn't capitalize that. Um, but if it's something you physically like installation or testing, so if you couldn't um, launch. Uh, use this asset until you've tested it, um, that would be capitalized. It's just, could you physically, um, not marketing, definitely not. You don't need to market it. Um, say it's a piece of machinery that makes a new product. And if the product doesn't sell because you've not marketed it, that's not nothing to do with a piece of machinery. That's just, just life. Um, so yeah, you, you don't physically desperately have to market something to use the asset. If you use it and you can't sell it because you've not marketed it, that's a different thing, but you can still use it. It's all about bringing the asset into use. AAT generally don't get too left field because you shouldn't really need to know about screen printing. Uh, it should be. That's an integral part of that. That is the typical things, installation, delivery, testing, and then marketing, product launch, service contracts are the ones that they generally, yeah, services again, that would just be uh, ignored. In reality, you would prepay it over the life of the service contract, but for the purposes of task one, ignore it. Cool. So, um, last question. Which of the one of these best describes the residual value for a non-current asset? So residual amount. So we've got the expected market value at the estimated date of disposal. The difference between the carrying amount and the estimated scrap proceeds, original cost less depreciation to date, or carrying amount plus its accumulated depreciation at any given in time. Remember, the residual, quite interesting this, quite interesting this, we'll go, we'll go through these. We've got quite a variety of answers, which is quite nice. Everyone's got it right so far. <coughs> so let's start at the bottom. A carrying amount plus its accumulated depreciation at any point in time. So the carrying amount is net book value, and its net book value is the cost less the accumulated depreciation at any given time. So if you add the accumulated depreciation at any given time, all that's going to do is take us back to the um, cost. That's not what we want. That's not residual value. Um, original cost less depreciation to date is net book value. So that's what it's worth at any point in time, not at the end of uh, the time that we're using it. So it's not that. Uh, now the difference between its carrying amount and the estimated scrap proceeds. So the estimated scrap proceeds, let's be honest, is the residual value. This is what we're gonna get for it when we're finished with it. And the carrying amount is what it's worth now. So the difference between the two is how much it's got left to fall between when we get rid of it and we get some money back for it. Whereas the last bit, the expected market value at the date of disposal, so it's either market value, i.e. someone's gonna buy it, or we're gonna sell it for scrap, or we wanna get some money for it somehow. Um, so that would be the one. So yeah, there's a few things. So cost is for what you physically paid for it. Accumulated depreciation is the, all the depreciation you've charged from when you first bought it to now. And then if you take that away from your cost, what that leaves you with is its current net book value. So that's what it's worth at the moment in time. Whereas the bit that you're gonna, even if you own it now, but the amount that you think you're gonna get when you finish using this asset is going to be the residual value. So expected market value or return, um, scrap proceeds at the date of disposal. So that's what you're going to get left. Because remember, depreciation is an estimate for how much that asset is going to fall in value from when you bought it 
to when you get rid of it. So if you know that it's not going to fall by the last thousand pounds because you're going to get some money for it and it's straight line, you can take that into account. Is that okay? Has anyone got any questions about anything AVBK related, AAT related, anything? Got another couple of minutes. Cool. Now that is a relatively easy task in the big picture of the exam. Typically students do very well on task one, they do pretty well on task two, which is disposals, they do not great on task three, which is uh, preparing accruals. Not great in task four, which is correcting journals and account reconciliation. And they do really well on task five, which is DETB. I mean, you've got to do your best on task three and four. Hopefully you do very well. Um, but you can't really skip a question because there's only five questions. Um, and, you know, it's a big. Each question there isn't like a 10 mark question. They're all at least 17, 18 marks. Um, so, yes, Sarah, no residual value when reducing balance or diminishing balance. They may give it to you. That is a red herring. Do not fall for that. It may, may give you residual value, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Um, so very careful of that. So that's one thing that catch you out. The other way is, is VAT. Um, never ever fall for that. Um, and then the only thing they can throw at you is uh, depreciation that might be pro rata per month and part X. I mean, part X isn't that bad. It's basically two separate transactions for the purposes of task one is one asset's been purchased. What did we get? Remember, you only capitalize what you should be capitalizing. And the other part is this asset's been sold and this is what we got for it. The fact that we didn't get cash for it is not important in task one. The fact that we may or may not got more or less than what we had it as held in the account, not relevant for task one. Basically, we're just looking for proceeds and that's it. Cool, like I say, I will get the recording sent around. Um, I forgot, Sarah, that's why we're here to help. Um, remember, there are loads of other revision sessions out there. Um, we are running, I think we made a decision to run them for, let me just get you the link. Um, till the exams come back on online and ABSY is running up to uh, the synoptic window, which is the 13th of July. Um, Rebecca's getting rave reviews of that, but she's out to have a baby. Uh, fingers crossed she doesn't, because I'm taking over on that. Uh, the revision sessions, you can sign up to or for here. Um, don't forget, we've got our student Zoom chat, six o'clock on Wednesday night. My Facebook Live, Thursday night on our Facebook page. Make sure you like our Facebook page, there's loads of good stuff on there. Uh, you might even win yourself an FI mug. Maybe. Um, and we've got our Dave and Kelly Dream Team do their Facebook Live six o'clock on a Monday night. Okay. Um, like I say, you can sign up to any of the revision sessions. Um, and FA Power. I've worked with Tim. Tim doing FA Power. Uh, see what he's playing at. Um, and remember, they're all going to on our YouTube channel as well. I've got to find the link. It's just First Intuition YouTube. That's straightforward. Thank you, Lenka. Cool. Right. Um, I'll let you all go. Um, you've all got my email address and anything like that. If you've got any questions or queries, get in touch. Cool. Have a good night and uh, stay safe. And I'll see you at some point somewhere in the AT world, I'm sure. <laughs>